While the Black Economic Empowerment Act and the financial sector codes of good practice have achieved degrees of success, there are still considerable shortcomings to be noted. That's according to KPMG, a global network of professional firms providing audit tax and advisory services. To discuss, I have with me Botumelu Ungushani, the director of BEE Advisory at KPMG. What a pleasure to meet with you today. Welcome to Leading Opinion. Thank you very much for having me. But Tumelo, I think let's begin by discussing and stressing the importance of the vision behind the BEE codes. I guess the real vision and the real importance as seen, um, you know, you can imagine from a, from a population that's 80% primarily black and almost 90% really uh, um, black or rather 80% mm -hmm. African and 90% black, you realize that the, the, the wealth is really in the... Um, hands of the minority. So the vision of BEE really is to try and address or redress those issues and ensure that there's equitable or relatively equitable uh, split of the economy or participation of the majority of the population in South Africa. Are we seeing commitment coming from the private sector with regards to its implementation? I think initially you, you, you had apprehension because it was not understood, but as time has gone, um, a lot of uh, companies are seeing a lot, more, a lot more positive and are coming up with ideas and things to, to, be, to be done differently. So there is some commitment uh, from a private sector. I think the challenge becomes, um, you know, when you're in the middle of a game, it's like playing games and you start thinking, are the rules really changing? But what, I've see, what I'm seeing is as much as foreign investment is coming in and there's some misunderstanding of what BEE is. And once they get an understanding of what it is, and they're saying, well, these are the rules that we're going to be playing with, then we'll, we'll accept it. And then they price their products or services accordingly. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit of a acceptance there. Mm -hmm. Looking at the revised codes, how significant are the changes? And how is it expected to affect small business in particular? Well, they are quite significant. I mean, in the past, the small businesses I will be talking about, small businesses, have not really had to be evaluated on all elements, when, whereas the large companies were evaluated on all elements. The smaller entities had an option of not having um, ownership. At the moment, there is, that is not, that has been taken away from them. Mm -hmm. So they need to start re-looking at it and say, well, what is it that we can do um, to ensure ownership but at the same time you can imagine a lot of these are owner managed entities or family owned how do we do it without necessarily losing too much control which mm -hmm. is unfortunately what the entrepreneurs are saying because a lot of these are entrepreneurial um, businesses more than you know somebody that something that's just been handed or handed down from one so family. naturally there's going to be a lot of resistance there is going to be a lot of resistance but um, I think the other challenge then becomes when you look at what has just come out um, last week with regards to the clarification of the broad-based and the ESOPs. And now uh, businesses are looking back and thinking, oh my goodness, what is now left as an option? You know, so those are the kind of um, things that small businesses are trying to grapple with. Is there any way for these family businesses to get around the codes? What happens if they don't comply? Well. It really depends. I mean, a lot of instances in our survey have shown in the, in the past that the push has actually been coming from the cu customers. So the customers are saying, well, wait a minute, you need to do something because I'm spending money with you. I need to get some recognition for, you know, what, what it is that uh, I'm spending with you. And if I'm spending with you and you're a QSE, but I'm not seeing any benefit, then I'm going to look elsewhere, mm -hmm. you know. So the, the push has been coming from, from the customers. So as much as there might be resistance, I don't think the resistance will, be, will, will result in growth for, for those small entities. Is there any incentives in place for these family-owned businesses? to get them to comply from the DTI? I think there is. There is, there is merit and there is incentive because I, uh, what, what you're looking at from, a, from, an, from a, what the country has been saying is we are actually trying to develop uh, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. more than anything. And that's the entire focus, really. Let's develop entrepreneurs. So if you're working along with someone that's within your, your uh, environment as a small business and you've identified them and you think, well, you know what? this employee is a really good employee and I, I would like to do something more than just give them extra money at the end of the day. Let me see how we can engage with them and ensure that they can form part of 
management, part of ownership. So that's the kind of incentive that you get, that mm -hmm. you get a little bit more loyalty from your employees as they see you doing a bit more within you know, the laws as well. Sure. What should be happening between the small business sector and the DTI to bring them together so that everybody has a clear sense of what's expected from them and how they can move forward to make it work? It's engagement. That's all it is. It's really if there's uh, regular engagement. Um, and I guess just, you know, as a, as a small as small business is coming together and saying, well, what is it that we genuinely can do? realistically can do, given that we've got such limited funds relative to the uh, bigger companies, what can be done and how, if you engage with the DTI, I think I've found them to be quite willing mm -hmm. to e explore, you know, what um, various uh, initiatives that you come up with and actually advise where that is concerned. I mean, I think one needs to realize that um, with the DTI, because of the limited number of people that are there, they're not able to do a lot of things mm -hmm. and but if you come in and you try and engage with them there i found them more than willing to actually accept and mm -hmm. listen to what the market is saying do the revised codes affect listed companies big business in any way they will they will definitely affect bus big business in a lot of ways um what one being obviously the uh, the the ownership i mean there they are priority elements that have been put in ownership is one but the major part that I've seen that which will affect it is the increased expense from a skills development or at least perceived increased expense. I mean, when I chat to my clients, I say it's not necessarily going to be an increased expense. Is how do you spend that money that you're already spending mm -hmm. effectively to ensure the training and the upskilling, the proper upskilling of the stuff that you've got and we not just your stuff, but also the rest of the sure. population. Would you say that companies, uh, listed companies and big business are in a better position when it comes to implementing these codes? One of the things that I think big business might have to do is relook at how they're actually addressing BEE. Instead of just having a BEE manager that looks, the, her whole or his whole objective is really at the end of the year when verification happens, you run around scrambling to get points. Um, it's to make sure that it actually becomes the lifeblood of the, yeah. and the backbone of the, of the entity or the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So that's another shift really that uh, big business needs to look at. So when you strategize about BE, it mustn't be just a tick box as one of the other elements to do. But I always say to, the, to my clients when we sit and strategize that, wait a minute, I don't just want your HR person or you know, your, your BE person. We, I actually need to see everybody within the environment, your procurement, your decision makers, and everybody. Mm. Those are the people that will actually make sure that BE gets implemented without disrupting business too much. Since it was implemented, the BEE codes, are we seeing companies and big business being more compliant generally than small business? Is there a greater degree of compliance coming through from big business? Yeah, we have seen. I mean, our survey has shown an improvement with regards to, you know, the points that are being generated or the points that each entity is achieving. So that has in effect, shown improvement. The challenge has been, I think, in, in a lot of instances, there's been a shopping around for opinions mm -hmm. with regards to, you know, can I get more points by sp even when I'm spending less or not actually doing much? And that's been a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think that is why you will, you, we saw the DTI three, four years ago, then look at it and say, well, we need to revisit the entire, um, you know, BE codes. How is these codes affecting the mining sector in particular? Because we know they've been struggling for quite some time to comply with the mining charter. There's still a bit of a struggle. And I think with the mining charter, or at least because it's been embodied in the legislation, they'd have to go through a whole rigmarole to go and rehash us. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as they're not quite... quite achieving, you know, when you compare what they're achieving relative to what the codes are saying, they were the first to come to do it, but they're not quite where they, they sh well, should be mm -hmm. from a code perspective. They are complying with the act and they're complying with le their le legislation, but they're far, there's a big gap. But real between, transformation has real been transformation very Real transformation has been very, very slow. With regards to Looking if you're at going the to compare the racial them. demographics, especially exactly if you're comparing the codes which are addressing the demographics with what the mining industry is actually achieving, mm -hmm. so that's been a bit of a challenge 
you know, and but you're these not these saying these are also multinational companies. But these are multinational companies. But we, you you do find a lot of other multinational companies in the ICT sector, but they they are doing a bit more than mm -hmm. uh, you know what you find happening within the the, the mining industry. Mm -hmm. So yes, the challenge there I think has been complying with the law and not necessarily looking at what B is doing or the codes are doing and saying, well, is there possibility of the law, the R charter embodied mm -hmm. in the law changing to ensure that it's compliant with, you know, the what where the charter is going, or rather not the charter, but rather where the codes are going. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what has been a bit of a challenge for the mining industry. Sure. My last question, looking at the listed companies on the JSC, are we seeing more black CEOs being employed? There's... I mean, we do. We're currently starting and a, also a survey. Yeah. Well, there's a there's there's been very various changes, and some of which, yes, there are. It's the process has been slow, though. It's not been to the extent that the DTI or the I guess uh, South African economy would like it to be. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's happening, but not at the rate that would be mm -hmm. you know ideal. Thank you so much for your time. It's been such a big pleasure to have you in here. No, thank you so much, Nassim, for having us.